There you go. And I go live. All right, we're live streaming. Aloha, everybody. Gungi Fat Choi, Chinese New Year. <laughs> awesome. See some familiar names in, in our participant list. Mahalo, everybody, for joining in. I'm going to give it a couple more minutes. I have some like nice music in the background or something. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, let's get started just so we have enough time for this fantastic panel that we have for our first official 2022 Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month presentation. Mahalo everybody for joining us. My name is Serena Fukushima. I'm with the Maui Invasive Species Committee and I'm helping to um, host and moderate this panel today. Um, just some really quick housekeeping rules before I pass it on to Chelsea. Um, this meeting is being recorded. It's gonna be posted later to the Hawaii Invasive Species Council YouTube page and um, possibly to the MISC YouTube page as well. We're also streaming live on Facebook. So it'll be um, posted on the Maui Invasive Species Committee Facebook page as well. Um, if you have any questions, this is a webinar, so you're not going to be able to um, unmic yourself or turn on your video. Um, but if you do have questions, please send them in the chat. We welcome questions and put them in there. I'll be moderating as well, um, as, well as Beth, and we'll be um, posing those questions to the panel when we have our question and answer time. And so I'm going to hand it over to Beth to launch the poll and then have Chelsea start with introductions. So mahalo for joining us. Thank you, Serena. And I'm going to launch a poll for just a couple uh, for a little under a minute. And this poll, if you don't mind, um, participating in it should be launched now so you can see it it just helps us with a little bit of background demographics to help us to better plan um, these invasive species webinars in the future so that should be up and running and we will leave it up for just about 30 seconds so you can share a little bit about where you're from and Thank you for participating. For those of you, for those of you on Facebook, um, sorry that you can't see this poll, but it's just asking a little bit of background about where you're all from. If you want to actually add that in the comments, what island or where you're joining us from, we appreciate that information because it helps us with our planning in these, these webinars. So it looks like I'll leave this up for another 15 seconds. And it looks like we've got folks joining from all over. There's definitely um, Maui Nui is here, but there are people from throughout the state that are joining us today. All right, so I think almost everybody's had a chance to participate. I'm gonna end the poll and just share it with you very quickly. Um, so we've got folks from all over and from a lot of different backgrounds. So thank you very much for participating. Yeah, mahalo Beth, that, that helps us at the end of the month figure out who's been attending and, and what we can do better next time to get more audience participation. But for now, I'm Chelsea. I am a planner with the Hawaii Invasive Species Council and I'm really excited to be here today for, I mean, this is our first webinar to kick off Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month. So this is a month long event. We have tons of webinars scheduled throughout the month. And if you've looked at our schedule, we have it set up by VAL. So these different climates, topography that define these boundaries between landscapes. And we're starting the first week at the Vau Akua. So the very top elevations of our islands. 
And this is such a great panel to have kicking it off because they are the folks, I mean, actually this panel of Wahine is up here talking about the watershed partnerships. And these are the partnerships that work in these really high remote places in the native protecting native flora and fauna that make up these ecosystems. Um, so a lot of folks don't get a chance to see these places. So I'm really excited to have them talk about that the work they, they do take us through like basically into these places that they work and, and just share their experiences and how they got into that. Um, so who we got today, um, we have Kim Thaler with uh, Mauna Kahalavai Watershed Partnership. And you can just raise your hand. So I think you guys can see the names. Um, Allison Burrell with East Maui Watershed Partnership. And Kylie Aina, Leeward Haleakala Watershed Partnership. So, so excited to have you all here. And what I'm gonna do right now is pass it over to each of our panelists, just to give a short introduction about themselves and, and the places that they work. Uh, so Kim, I think we're gonna start with you. Okay, so I'll just pull up my presentation. Please bear with me. Ah, okay. Oh. Okay, so everybody can see my slideshow, hopefully. Okay, thank you, Chelsea and Serena and Beth um, and everybody tuning into this. Um, it's pretty exciting to be heading off Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month. Um, so my name is Kimberly Thayer and I am with the Mauna Kahalawai Watershed Partnership. I've been working here for a little over nine years now and it's basically my dream job and I love it. And so I'll tell everybody a little bit about what we do today. Um, so starting at the top, like they said, we are in the Valakua and this is our Malka forests. As you can see here, they are dense and lush and spongy and misty and moist. And I call this wonderland. Um, they're so nice and native. And this is the landscape that we protect um, because these places are home to trees and ferns and plants and mosses, insects and birds and snails, many of which are found here and nowhere else on the whole entire planet. Um, they are natural treasures, they are cultural treasures, and um, we are so lucky to have them. They evolved together for millions and millions of years and are in beautiful harmony and balance with one another. And one thing significant that these forests do is capture the water that we all drink and rely upon and live upon on our islands. So we are the Mauna Kahalawai Watershed Partnership. So we take care of all the whole entire Mauna Kahalawai or the West Maui Mountains. Um, and one thing significant is the water from this mountain feeds about three quarters of all Department of Water Supply customers. So everybody on the West side, everybody in central Maui to Maliko Gulch and everybody It's our watersheds, these forested landscapes that soak up all the water from the rain and the fog. And this water comes down in our streams and aquifers um, and feeds us all. And so this is about 50,000 acres that we protect. And you can see that we are one of three watershed partnerships on the island. And you'll learn from the other two shortly. Um, so when we look up at the mountains, they look like they're all green and lush. And I think you figure that green means good because it's plants and trees and such. But when you look a little bit closer and maybe the seasons change, you see more of what's actually going on on the ground. And so if we go on the ground where this picture is taken, I should say this is Waihe'e Valley. Waihe'e Ridge Trail is down over here for reference. Um, this is what is actually on the ground. And you can see, unlike my first picture I showed, this is not so lush or dense or green or anything. Um, this tree that's kind of scraggly here is an ohia lehua, which would ordinarily look like this or this or this. Um, but unfortunately, it is like this. 
And the reason that we are in this state is that there have been things like invasive animals like pigs, goats, deer, and sheep um, that eat up all of our native plants and really destroy the landscape. There's human impacts and fire that can also clear out the landscape. And once the native cover is gone, what moves in are invasive species like invasive grasses, um, and other plants like this weed here is Clydemia, which is literally one of the most invasive species on the whole entire planet. And we are unfortunate or fortunate to have it all over our mountain. Um, and what happens when you put all these problems together, like the, um, the feral ungulates, the pigs, goats, deer, the weeds, the fire, the human impacts, um, we get problems like this. So this is in Ukumehame where there's been wildfire, there's goats, you can see the forest is gone and a rain came and what happens is all of this soil and everything has washed down into the ocean. And this is not just problems that are far out in the mountains because things that happen up Malka inevitably affect us down Makai. And so this affects not only our quality of life, and our natural spaces, but this also affects our water supply um, and all of our lives. So what do we do about this? Um, the first thing that we all do in conservation is kind of draw a line in the sand. And so we put up fences and fences are our main line of defense against pigs, goats, deer and sheep and all these animals that don't belong in our forests and really destroy native forests. Um, it's really hard work, but you can see on this picture on the left, which side is outside the fort or, you know, which side of the fence is outside and which side is inside and protected. Um, so once the fences are up and the animals are out, we move on to invasive weed control. And this is one example of a nice big fat giant Ohi Alehua, which is that tree I showed earlier with all the different color flowers that is the last man standing amid all of this strawberry guava. So this invasive strawberry guava, another one of the planet's most invasive species has moved in and choked out everything else. And it's probably just the size and age and ancientness of this tree that has enabled it to survive. So we do things like weed control to eradicate um, invasive species like strawberry guava out of our forest. And this is like a problem all across the mountain and all across our islands. Um, and it's super duper hard work and it can be seem hopeless at times, but there are reasons for hope. So this picture on the right is a strawberry guava um, that has been treated and what is popping out from inside of it is little baby ohi alehua and moss and moa. And here on the left where strawberry guava has been cleared, this is all baby koa that is sprouting up on the ground on its own. Like these were not planted. So the basic thing is if you give the native forest a chance, a fighting chance, most of the time it will persevere. Um, so other things we do is take out volunteers because one of the best ways to learn is to do it yourself. And so we try and get people's hands dirty and they see firsthand the impacts of invasive species and the hope of bringing back native plants for future generations. Um, we also work on doing presentations in schools and getting kids involved to try and inspire the next of conservation heroes. Um, and that's in a nutshell, the work that we do to hold on to really, really awesome, landscapes like this. Um, it's awesome. And so this is our team of 11 people that does all this work, men and women, um, younger and more mature, um, but we all love what we do. So thank you very much. Mahalo. Mahalo, Kim. That was wonderful. And thanks for taking us to your watershed. That was great imagery. Um, next, I'll pass it over to Allison to talk about East Maui Watershed Partnership and herself. Hi, thank you, everybody. Um, I don't have quite as many cool pictures and information as Kim does, but 
What I can say is um, pretty much everything that she mentioned they do over on West Maui, we pretty much do the same thing over on East Maui. <laughs> so um, you just kind of imagine all that just in a different part of the mountain, because of course, different areas of the uh, mountain bring different challenges as far as the exact species that you're working with and areas that you're working with, whether it be the types of invasive species or threats, um, but you know, we all kind of work on the same kind of ideas, but um, this is what it does mostly in the watershed is it rains, which is a good thing. So <laughs> I always have to show a picture of myself out in the forest to re like remind myself and others that, you know, that we, we go out there and we're out in the work and this is, this is what it looks like most of the time when we're out in the watershed. So um, the East Maui watershed, um, so Kim had that great map that showed the three watershed partnerships here on Maui, but um, the East Maui watershed partnership was created in 1991 and it was actually the first watershed partnership. Um, there's three on Maui and there's 10 throughout the whole state. So if you guys are on other islands, if you check it out, you probably have a watershed partnership on your island as well. And what happened back in 1991 is some of the major landowners decided like, hey, there's this beautiful native forest, this watershed area that's really important for collecting water for us and our drinking water and the native species that live there. And the idea was we can get more done by working together rather than apart. Because um, as we all know what we do in our lawn, if it doesn't matter if you're treating the invasive species in your yard, if your neighbor has it, it's gonna jump the fence and come over. There's, they don't recognize boundaries. So by working together and creating these partnerships, we can do more large scale conservation efforts across larger lands and really kind of work as a united front. And so the major landowners that got together were Haleakala Ranch, the state of Hawaii, Haleakala National Park, East Maui Irrigation and the Nature Conservancy, which are still our partners today. And then this also includes the County of Maui, even though they're not a landowner, um, this area is one of the largest uh, water recharge sites for the island of Maui and very important for us. So of course the county is interested um, in the health of that as well. So you can see on the map there, um, the different land areas and, and the different landowners kind of delineated with the colors. It's about 100,000 acres in total. And with that, that's all kind of conservation area, about half of it, a little less than half, is actually being managed actively at the time. So even though all that's part of the conservation area, only um, half or less is being managed um, properly. So. The overall mission of the East Maui Watershed Partnership is to protect the watershed, um, protect the native forests and their component native species, and then educating the public and local community. So kind of the same things that uh, Kim was talking about. So here's our, our current crew here. <laughs> and so like she kind of mentioned, the way we do that is we go out, we protect the native forest by researching it, studying it, kind of figuring out what the threats are to it. Um, a lot of times that involves building fences to keep out wild ungulates, which include things like pigs, deer, goats. Um, our native forests, are they, those weren't here before humans brought them. So these forests were here way before humans, and they're not used to that. They're not used to these animals coming in and browsing and doing all that. So we build fences, as, as Kim said, that first line of defense to protect what we already have. And then inside those fences, we go in we figure out what the uh, main invasive species are, whether it's animal or plant or um, disease, and we start to work to remove those threats. And then of course, um, outreach and education, like what we're doing today, we have a really strong um, outreach where we, I myself go and uh, talk to classes. We used to take kids out on hikes. We do volunteer trips as well, but you know, it's all kind of case by case right now with the current situation. Um, but I do, whoop, whoop, there we go, invite you guys if you want to learn more about that or do any, you know, contact us for outreach for if you're an educator or anything like that. Um, follow us on our website and our social media sites and you can kind of jump more in depth into the different components of what we do. So thank you. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, that's, it's really helpful to understand the partnership 
part of the watershed partnerships and like you put it so well with like invasive species like they don't see land boundaries and in even native species it's like you really need to have that partnership to be able to do a holistic approach to protecting watersheds um so we'll move forward and we'll have um kylie talk about leeward haleakala watershed partnership Hello, my kako. Um, thank you guys so much for the great uh, starting off this conversation and, you know, really letting everyone know what we do as watershed partnerships. So I'm kind of just going to tag on to that and share this presentation with you guys. Okay. So again, my name is Kylie Aina and I'm with Leeward Haleakala Watershed Restoration Partnership. Um, we work uh, similarly to both the other partnerships and all the work that we do is, you know, basically the same as far as what, how we restore native forests. So I'm not going to go too in depth to that since you ladies did such a great job of explaining it, but I'll go in about a little bit about Leeward specifically. So Leeward is, you know, uh, similar to the map that Allison shared. We also have a lot of different landowners that we work with. We were formed in 2003 and we have 11 partners. Um, we work with about 43,000 acres of land um, with the goal of restoring dry land forests on the leeward slopes of Haleakala. So this is like Makwao through Ulapalakua to Kaupo. Kaupo is kind of like our last boundary line and we're everywhere between 3,500 to 6,500 feet in elevation. Um, our goal is to restore this historical forest cover of dryland forest that is his only about 10% of that kind of forest is left. And I've even read in other areas that it might even be closer to five or 4% that's left. So just really wanted to touch on this briefly about the difference between leeward and Windward forests, uh, we're dealing with a much drier situation than, you know, Allison shared with her picture in the rain. We do definitely get rained on and we get those days probably 50-50, but not quite as much as East Maui because we're located on this drier side of the island. So you can see, you know, those blue and green areas. That's where the wind and rain are hitting that front face of Haleakala. And then we're kind of on the back side of the mountain. So we're a little more protected. And that creates a lot different environment for different kinds of plants to grow um, that you're not going to find necessarily everywhere that's really wet. You know, these plants are um, came here many thousands of years ago and they adapted to wherever they settled. And so the plants that adapted on our side are different than what's just across the way over in East Maui or, you know, Mauna Kalavai versus Haleakala. There's the same plants, but they're going to react differently to moisture and dryness and um, like they said earlier, they're really resilient. And so they find these ways to thrive in wherever they land. So um, I just wanted to now go into kind of the core reasons why we protect watershed um, and native forests is, you know, number one, we all need water. So as you can see from this map, the majority of our groundwater recharge comes from watershed partnership lands. So it's really important that we restore those areas in order to keep our water supply good for generations. And, you know, this is a big reason why uh, Hawaiians reference these upper areas as the Wa'akua. They understood that Akua, you know, are these natural resources, these native plants, and the way that we get things like water, you know, whose manifestation, it, it's Kane is the manifestation of water, or sorry, water is the manifestation of Kane. Um, the way that we protect these gods is by protecting these high elevation forests and these resources. So yeah, water is a huge reason why we do this. Um, another reason why we do this is biodiversity. You know, it's, we always are focused on plants, but it's really about everything. So this whole Lahui, Ohana, you know, of native bugs, native uh, birds, you know, all these beautiful things that make up the native forest. And again, are also representations of these Akua and things that are important culturally. And so that brings me to the third reason, which is cultural resources. Um, without these native forests, we can't perpetuate these cultural practices and we can't, you know, really connect to our Akua and our culture. So there's all these different 
things that we have, you know, we have kapa and all these dyes that we can make from native plants. And we have a kuahu, which is kind of a uh, altar, which you can, you know, really empower different gods or different things that you're trying to work on in your own life. Uh, there's a lot of uses for a kuahu. And then we have tools like rope, which was a really essential part of Hawaiian life. Uh, and, you know, things like ie uh, kuku, which are kapa beading tools. Those are all made from native plants and, you know, ki'i or tiki as they were commonly known. We need these resources in the forest to be able to perpetuate these things into the future. Um, so this is, now I'm just gonna share a couple pictures of, you know, leeward haleakala, our, one of our main plants is the koa. And so this is a really uh, old and thriving koa tree. As you can see, there's an understory of ferns and, and here you can see, you know, kind of the invasives creeping in. And, but, you know, when you do give them this environment to thrive, then they really do a good job at that. Um, this picture is looking out from uh, leeward haleakala towards Hawaii Island. So you're looking at, you know, the Mauna of Hawaii Island, but this is, you know, kind of the Wau Akua zone that you're looking at here and this is even higher up on the mountain this is towards like the pico towards the center of haleakala and this is you know the mist and the clouds that we're trying to bring to us by restoring these native forests and collecting those fog with you know the plants like the ohia with the really particular flower that uh, kim showed us earlier those little bristles and all that they actually collect water from the fog and, you know, so this is another akua that dwells in the wow akua, which is our clouds, our rain, all those water resources. So as far as, you know, Hawaii Invasive Species Month, we definitely deal with a lot of invasive species. This huge green yellow thing is Baconia, and it's a really uh, bad invasive plant over on Leeward Haleakala. And all it takes is one seed, one start, you know, to get a really bad problem. So that's why it's really important. We're all conscious of when we go into these wild aqua that we are, you know, being careful that we don't bring anything in because there's a huge mountain and we can't cover the whole space. And when one thing gets there, it spreads, you know, really quickly. So that's just an example of an invasive. And then, you know, like Allison and Kim both shared, there's a lot of things we do to restore native species, like in moving, removing the invasives um, and outplanting natives. So here's some of our crew collecting uh, koa seeds that will eventually be given to probably native nursery to start up for us. And then when they're grown to a good size, then we'll bring them out into the field and plant them again. Um, so that's the conclusion of my presentation. And this is just uh, some of my contact information here. If anyone has any questions and some pictures of our team in the field uh, doing what we all love to do. So. Uh, mahalo, you guys, for having us here today, and I look forward to answering your guys' questions. Wow, thank you, Kylie. That was amazing, and and just for emphasizing the importance, like, of Hawaiian practice and and these forests and the aqua and like what the different, you know, the native flora and fauna represent, and also making that connection. I mean, water connects everything, right? It connects us from the Valakua all the way down to the Valakahakai, and then we're kind of in that middle placement in the Kanaka area. So it's like what we do up top affects everything down, and then especially where we are, wedged between these two places of the upper and the lower. Um, so that's definitely what we're hitting on for this month with how we've set it up through the schedule. And I'm really happy that you guys, your presentations just complemented each other really, really well. So I'm excited to get into these, the Q and A here. Um, we do have some already prepared questions for our panelists, um, but there is a Q and A box. So we do wanna hear questions from you guys in the audience. Um, so if you have any burning questions, just put them in there and then Serena and Elizabeth can kind of bring those into our discussion today. Um, and questions, I'll kind of target certain people just depending on time, but this very first question is kind of, I want everybody to answer it because it's it's the seed, you know? It's it, So I wanna know what experiences brought you into your current role working 
at your current work, your watershed partnership. You kind of took us into your present day, but what got you there? Like, and, and it doesn't matter. It can be any like a spiritual, you know, childhood, whatever. I would love to hear from each of you. So why don't we circle back to Kylie and we'll start with you. Uh, so for me personally, um, I grew up on Maui and I've always loved being outside, but I really didn't, I had an interest in native plants since I was young. I was fortunate to attend Kamehameha schools, kind of get an introduction to what native plants are, but it wasn't until actually I was in high school that I realized that I really wanted to move forward with, you know, maybe a career path or, you know, focus on learning more about native plants. I I have to say growing up, I was, you know, I had a general knowledge, but I really didn't understand the significance of our native forests and plants, uh, even growing up here and being, you know, um, Hawaiian, it was something that I felt like wasn't really, you know, opportunities like this. I, maybe I wasn't aware of them, but I didn't have access to that uh, as much as I think I, you know, everyone should. And so um, it was when I was a senior in high school, I decided that I would start volunteering with Al Wahi, which is kind of right uh, in between all leeward. It's kind of right there at Ulupalakua Ranch. And I volunteered with them for about a year. And then I decided to do my senior project with them. And after graduating high school, I just like stuck with it and eventually got a part time job with them. And that was really when my eyes opened to what native forests are and I think once you start seeing native plants in that light you know you start seeing them everywhere and you're like oh like why is only native plants up here and like why aren't we having them everywhere and um, I led me to actually pursue a degree in Hawaiian language and so I went to Maui College and I felt like just really understanding the cultural significance of everything too was really important so um, I did four years of Hawaiian language and got my bachelor's degree um, and throughout that whole time I've sought out you know internships and just you know making connections volunteering with different organizations from Hilt to um, experiencing other um, areas like Kahakai like you said it's from the Mauna to Kahakai you know it's all different you're going to find different plants in every area you know so just really getting myself into the field I feel like connections are really important so just, you know, making those connections through the working or volunteering and, and learning. And that's kind of what got me here today was just trying to seek areas where I could learn. And it was really, you know, enjoyment as, you know, Kim shared in the beginning, it's her dream job and she doesn't, it's like the best thing to do. And so, you know, they say, do what you love. And I, I feel like this is something I really love. And so I just tried to stick to that. And yeah. Oh, right on. Yeah. I mean, it's hard work. So you really have to love what you're doing. Uh, yeah. Well, Kim, how about you? Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, yeah. So Maui is my home. I grew up out in Haiku, which like used to be the boonies. It's more populated now. But when I was a kid, we were like the only people living out there. And we had kind of like this like stand I wouldn't call it necessarily a forest but like a grove surrounding our house and I used to go trampling through that following my brother and my older cousins um, but I spent a lot of time outdoors and I've always loved trees since like being a kid and I used to watch National Geographic videos all the time um, like I remember going to Cinemagic the video store and <laughs> finding all the National Geographic section and watching all those videos, but like learning about like the oh -oh through that and like learning that there was only like one left and he was calling for his maid and could never find her. And um, I guess that piqued my interest, but I never thought of this as like a career path necessarily. Um, in school, I did like all the hiking trips I possibly could. Um, in high school, I volunteered for a little bit with the Nature Conservancy, um, but even then I didn't think of this as a career path. I went away for college and came back. Um, I started volunteering for the Nature Conservancy again, leading hikes into Waikamoi, um, interpretive hikes and you know the importance of native species and everything. And I was at an alumni event I went to Seabury and was talking to one of the guys in the class below me and he was saying his 
classmate had this job where he's like, he lives with me, but I never see him because he's always working in the mountains. And he does these like camping trips all week long. And he's just in the forest all the time. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, this is a job. Like, this is a real job. Like, how do I get in there? Um, <laughs> I was like, what? And um, yeah, so I guess kind of by happenstance, I got my foot in the door with um, West Maui and um, it's been awesome. And one of the things I get to do is tell people all about the native forest and why it's awesome and why they should care. And so I guess it's like Kylie said, it's, you know, you do something you love and it doesn't feel like work necessarily. Um, like it is work and it takes effort and stuff, but it um, it's very gratifying um, and very good. Oh, right on, Kim. Yeah, thanks for sharing that love. I, I totally feel it from you. It's really fun. And I laugh because I have a similar experience with somebody saying, oh, I get to fly in helicopters and like go camping in the forest. I was like, oh, what? Yes. <laughs> Allison, how about you? Yeah. Uh, well, mine's a little different because I'm more a Malahini to this land. I didn't grow up here. So uh, I actually moved to Maui back in 2003. Um, my sister lived here. And so I decided to come out and hang out. But my first job here was actually being a tour guide leading tourists on hikes. And I always loved the outdoors, which is why I got that job. And so I was taking tourists on hikes and I was learning about the plants that we were seeing. I was learning about the cultural connections to kind of talk to them about it. And I started getting super interested in it and like just how there is so many cultural connections to the plants. But then I started kind of learning a little bit. There wasn't a whole lot of native species. I remember tourists would ask me, is this native? And I'd be like, I don't really know. I got to figure that out. And I started figuring it out. And I was like, huh, this is different. This isn't native. Like, what does native mean? And, and where are the native plants? And, and how does it all work? Well, then the same tour company hired somebody who worked for, at the time, it was called West Maui Mountains Watershed Partnership, now Mauna Kahalawai Watershed Partnership. And um, those of us that work in conservation love our job, awesome, doesn't always pay the bills. So she, she was moonlighting in her second career as a tour guide and uh, working during the week in the watershed. And I talked to her about her job and I was like, oh my gosh, that sounds so cool. You fly in helicopters, you go camping, you're outdoors. You don't have to answer tourist questions. <laughs> and I said, was all for it. So when a job opening came, I uh, immediately applied and I actually started working for the West My Mountains Watershed Partnership doing field work and doing kind of the, the helicopters and fence building. And I started to just self-study all the plants and just the forests we were going to were incredible. Unlike anything I'd ever seen before. I mean, like you picture your favorite movie where they have like this fantasy forest that fairies and stuff live in, you know, like that's the forest I was in. I was like, they exist. What is this place? <laughs> and I'd never seen anything like it. And I was like, people need to know about this. People need to know it exists. And then you start learning about the threats to it and you're like, no, no, that can't be happening. <laughs> this needs to be here for the people, for everyone. And so um, I transitioned into doing outreach and kind of spreading that part of the, the forest. And, and the, gosh, that was at East Maui in 2010. So it's been what, 12 years I've been working doing the outreach side of things. And yeah, it's totally my passion to like get our youth involved, getting them out there telling them the difference between plants. They're not, not all created equal. And like, it's going to be up to them to really create the changes and keep the threats from coming. And so, and it, I'll, I'll talk to anybody that will listen. Like my husband laughs at me because we'll go to the mainland and I'll be like talking to people about the native forests of Hawaii. And he's like, these people don't care. <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> but like, it's that passion. I think you just, once you see it and you're a part of it and you understand it, it's just, it's just, kind of comes out <laughs> so that's it <laughs> yeah I mean I feel it's really important to have messengers like you three to really be the messengers for these places because not many people get to access them or see them and I just really love the theme of 
you know, you all went on your own journey of learning more, you know, and, and finding out more information, something just piqued your interest in these places. And you're like, I, I need to know about this. Um, and, and that was a good segue, Allison, because I do, I have a question, but also John in our chat box um, kind of asked this question in a similar way. Um, so he put, what is the most important watershed project that you want to do but are not able to do and what would you need to be able to do it um and i pose this question as <laughs> as what keeps you up at night and and serena had a funny answer she's like my husband's snoring but we're talking about it in <laughs> like you know this watershed management role and and you know under the theme of hawaii invasive species awareness month um so allison maybe i'll start with you on that one uh, well, I think what keeps me up at night is the fact that these forests had millions of years to live together before humans came, and they learned how to live with one another. It was like a thing of beauty that we all can learn from. They all started to learn how to support one another, and they didn't really compete with any, each other that much. It's like they became this beautiful working environment, and then people came and either intentionally or unintentionally brought different things. And some of those things started causing harm. And I, our native forests lost their defenses over time because they became this like working forest. So like you go to the mainland and things have thorns or they're poisonous. It's because they had to defend themselves where our native forests lost those mechanisms because they were working together. And so they lost these defense mechanisms. They lost the thorns and the poisons and the things that now that these other stuff coming from the mainland that are threatening them, they don't have those defenses anymore. It's like this beautiful, weak little environment where you're just like, no, and these strong invasive species are coming in. And you know, I, I see them just taking over so effortlessly in some places. And like we're we're all small crews, we're all small people. And I would love that the state had 1%, even 1% of their funding going towards conservation efforts would make a huge impact in growing our crews and the ability of work that we could do. But in the meantime, if we can't have that, I would love to get more of the people involved in understanding these places exist and changing some of their daily habits. You know, we all need to do that in different ways, but just changing some of our daily habits to do what we can to support that, whether it be cleaning your shoes between hikes to supporting biocontrol efforts that have a major more impact than just hand pulling weeds out there, which is what we're doing sometimes. Um, so that's kind of my main thing. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Allison. I, yeah, funding is definitely an underlying theme to a lot of constraints. Um, yeah, how about uh, Kylie, you got something that keeps you up at um, night <laughs> yeah for me I personally you know I'm still pretty young I'm 26 but even talking to like my mom and my grandparents Maui has changed the, all islands they've changed so drastically just within the, the lifetime of like my mom for example and it keeps me up at night to think you see it everywhere whether it's with um, tourism or affordable housing or everything that's causing the way of Hawaii life to be kind of diminished. And, I, and our native plants are just the same. The more native um, invasive plants get here, whether it's through, you know, imports or people, um, you know, we had rapid ohia death, like something can change overnight. Like who would have thought that we would have had rod that would take out one of our most significant plants in that way. And so for me, it's just finding these ways to perpetuate these plants for, you know, my children and, you know, my children's children. And I just can't imagine Hawaii isn't Hawaii without these plants, without these uh, animals and insects. So I just for me to think about whatever ways are possible to educate people, you know, it's like no, it doesn't matter whether you're from here or not. If you become educated, you can be a catalyst for change. And so you just need to, what keeps me up at night is just thinking, well, what happens if we don't do anything now? You know, the time is now to really highlight these things and just, you know, as far as a project that I would want to do that I don't know how I'd be able to do it. It's just, you know, getting native plants everywhere, you know, starting, you know, people 
to have them in, you know, their own yards, which is a great step, or just, you know, creating different areas that are dedicated to having native plants. Or like Allison said, if the state could just allocate, you know, a small amount of funding and, and maybe even making it, you know, um, that parks that are part of the state or, you know, making native plants and restoring native habitat an essential part of Hawaii is something that I would, you know, and I think we're getting closer, like all the time, especially lately, there's a lot more awareness brought to native plants. Um, and I think that's only growing, which is so awesome. So I don't think it's not uh, impossible. And that's what gives me hope is seeing today that there are so many more opportunities just from when I was younger. And so just to see Maui, you know, more or all the islands move towards restoring that instead of further away of losing more. Um, that's kind of my, yeah. I love it. And I love, especially in a time when we can't necessarily connect in person, like why not connect with plants and get like a native plant? I love the picture of the school with the, the plant garden. I can't wait to see it in, you know, a few months. Um, oh, tsunami alarm month. Um, Kim, <laughs> how about you? Um, so the question that keeps me up at night or what's actually in the back of my mind constantly, I think at honestly all times throughout the day, and especially when I'm driving around is how to make it so there's native plants and native forests all over the place again. So whenever I'm like even driving to work in Oluwalu, I'm looking at the poly the whole time and thinking, gah, this used to be forest, this whole thing, and how do I make it be forest again? Um, and everywhere, whenever I drive to Hana or around the backside, I'm like, how do I make this be all native forest again? Um, that's pretty much everywhere I go is what I'm thinking about. If I'm ever looking out the window, driving with you in the car, that's probably <laughs> what I'm thinking about. Um, but <laughs> And so but one thing I think about is how to make it so, you know, if it's not me, whoever can just be on the mountain constantly, all day, every day, working from like the top down, taking out every single invasive thing as you go along. Um, that's one idea. Or my other idea is like every yard and place and school should have native plants growing in it and I look at like the medians of the highway I'm like why aren't we planting native stuff in the median of this road and in this little grassy area in this parking lot and in this strip of land right in front of the mall why don't we put native plants in all of these places um that's pretty much what's going through my mind all the time um yeah, so I used to be on the county arborist committee. And so a lot of that was like, put native plants in your parking lot. There's stuff adapted to every landscape you have. So just put in native stuff and it'll be good. Um, but yeah. <laughs> I love it. The campaign starts here. <laughs> awesome. Um, oh, Monte has a really awesome question that everybody's doing questions I already had. So I, I feel like we're all on the same page here. So. Uh, he put into the Q&A with all the challenges faced by our watersheds and forests from invasive species, climate change to public apathy, what successes or factors make you feel hopeful and keep you fighting the good fight? Uh, anybody, whoever wants to kick it up. <laughs> all right, I'll chime in. <laughs> uh, so it's it's the small wins sometimes, you know, that, that help. Um, and that's what keeps you going because if we don't take one step forward, even if it's small, like nothing gets done, you know? And so, yeah, we can, I think that's the thing in conservation. It's so easy to get bogged down. Well, this is happening or this is happening. Blah, blah, blah. But I kind of look at like, look at Oahe, you know, this is an area where it was so degraded that they fenced it off and just tore everything out and then started replanting natives and it's coming back. And then look at how that inspired you Kylie, to, to get into this work. And like, it's when I go into a classroom and then all of a sudden I get these like 
Mahalo cards and the little things they write in that just like tickles my heart to death. And I'm just like, oh my God, these little kids, like it's so cute. They just like have this like wide eyed view, you know, that's so amazing. And that reminds me, we all need to have that wide eyed view, you know, that like we can do this and like, let's just start doing it. Take one foot in front of the other and just start putting the plants in the yards, telling other somebody else, give a plant to a neighbor. Like a neighbor helped us out the other day. And I was like, hey, thanks for helping us. You just moved into your house not that long ago. You want some landscaping plants. Here you go. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's that kind of, of thing. And then, you know, there there is wins. Like, you know, we're still keeping things knocked back and the invasive species knocked back and they're encroaching, but maybe slowly as it be. And, and you know, it's all those kinds of things for me that that I try to focus on. And also... I'm going to put one more thing. I got really excited. And when tourism is starting to change right now, because we started uh, trainings for tour guides, because I was a tour guide. So I understood like the connection of like trying to educate tour guides about some of this stuff. And so seeing that change with the uh, pandemic and like it's slow, but I'm starting to see more of their management goals kind of going towards like sustainable tourism that is a win for me. I'm, I'm really excited about that. And I hope we can become a part of that too. Yeah. Right on, Allison. I, I think maybe we only have a few minutes left, so maybe I'll, I'll leave it with that question for Kim and Kylie, but also I think kind of woven into that is what can people do to help? Um, the watershed, invasive species management. I mean, it's all connected, but I'll leave that to you guys to kind of address as, as you, as you want. So, um, how about Kim? Oh, what can people do? People, well, there's small to big actions that people can take. So it's, I would say small things would be like cleaning your shoes before you go hiking and make sure you're not carrying any seeds or hitchhikers or anything when you go hiking. Um, if you are like one of those super adventurous hikers, be mindful of where you go. Cause there are people that go venturing far off trail into places that we might not even necessarily go to because there's so, such sensitive plants out there that we don't wanna disturb ourselves. So just be, mindful of places you go and maybe refrain from going to those places. Um, things like planting native plants in your yard. I have um, one of the things, my house, I live by the ocean and it's pretty much the native plants are the only thing that grow in the salt air. And I actually have two volunteer plants that popped up in my yard because I think the chickens spread the seeds from the plants that I had planted. And so it's like, it's working. I was like, oh my God, there's like new stuff popping up from the stuff that I planted. Um, yeah, and another really, really big thing people can do, and this speaks towards our funding. I don't know if a lot of people know, but we do not have any guaranteed funding. We have to apply for our, apply for grants every year or two for our whole entire lives because there is never a sure source of funding that is just dedicated to the work we do. So we have to appeal to the county and appeal to the state and appeal to all kinds of private foundations. So the more people can testify to the county council, to the state legislature, to advocate for funding support for our watersheds would go a long way towards perpetuating the work that we do. Um, and then kids getting involved. So the kids that learn things in school to teach their parents um, to hopefully one day grow up and work in the watershed with us um, because there needs to be more and more people coming up to carry on the torch um, is really important. And I would say just one of the most probably gratifying things that happened is, you know, we take out school groups or before COVID, we were taking out school groups and all kinds of groups to volunteer on Wahia Ridge Trail to clear strawberry guava and to like plant native plants. And um, last year we were doing a training with another crew 
And one of the young guys on their crew said, hey, do you remember me? I came on a Waihe'e Ridge hike years ago when I was in high school and now he's working for the watershed partnership. And I was like, oh my God. And he was like, yeah, it was like that hike that like opened my eyes to think like, wow, I could do work like this. And lo and behold, when he grew up, he started doing watershed work. And I was like, oh my God, that's like living the dream, man. That's really cool. Um, so anyway, just that. Full circle right there. <laughs> um, we only have like a minute left, um, but Kylie, I, I want to end it with you and you could I, I feel like Kim did a great job talking about what you can do but maybe things that you know give you hope for the future yeah so definitely um how Allison started off you know looking at Oahe or other areas like those fence line pictures of like restored forests versus you know grasslands and just thinking about what would have happened if these watershed partnerships weren't formed? You know, where would we be today? We would be so much worse off. And just knowing that if we can prevent and move in the right direction just that long in 15, 20 years, you know, what, where are we going to be 20 years from now if we just keep going and only move more in a positive direction? And so just being hopeful that, you know, you, you kind of have two choices. It's either you do nothing or you do something. And to do something, we do see results and they're not anywhere near where any of us want to be, but you know, that's the only way to get there is to keep moving forward and to be hopeful and to see that just with the work that we are doing now, those forests that are still surviving and coming back to life, you know, they wouldn't be there unless someone would have stepped in. Because at this point, it's that, you know, everything is gone haywire already so if we don't do anything it's just going to continue to get worse so just really having hope and seeing what has already been done and also um, you know like Kim said about the next generation seeing those kids who go on a hike and and have you know that feeling and then they want to do something about it too so just to briefly touch on what you can do I think educating others because you never know what conversation is going to spark in someone to want to do something or at least just make them aware and want to tell other people and grow that consciousness of what what this work means and how it really helps all of us you know we all need water we all enjoy Hawaii for the place that it is so we all have a small part in you know protecting that and restoring it mm, wow yeah that was a great way to end it Kylie and mahalo it's a each of you, Kim, Allison, Kylie, for joining us today and to our audience for participating and putting some questions into the chat. This was just a great conversation to kick off Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month. And, and thank you for connecting us to these spaces that you guys get to work in and probably call your second home. I'll pass it over to Serena. Yeah, mahalo nui, mahalo to these wahine mauna and all their crew. As an outreach specialist, I can attest that when you see one of us, there's at least a dozen others that are not here in the Zoom because they're out there, you know, huli kalima ilalo, like putting their hands in the dirt and they're doing that day-to-day -day work every single day and tirelessly because they have that passion for it. And so I know there's a lot of you folks as well in our um, participant group that are also conservation folks. So just a huge mahalo to all of you as well for speaking and being the voices of, and I get, I've been in this for 10 years and I still get choked up every time, but for being the voices and for advocating and protecting the most precious resources in not just Hawaii, but in my opinion, the world, I'm biased, but I think that what we have is so special and I just mahalo all of you for your tireless work every day. Um, I'm gonna just drop a whole bunch of stuff in the chat right now, but for those who are still with us, um, if you wanna learn more and connect with our panelists, learn more about their organizations, I put their respective web pages in the chat um, as well as um, you can go and find their contact info to get involved with them or to learn about their initiatives. And they all have really amazing social media accounts as well if you're a social media person. Um, our next Haitam presentation is going to be tomorrow, February 2nd, starting at 1130. 
that presentation is Hui Kahuli rushing to save Hawaii's iconic land snails. And that's going to be with Deal in Our Wildlife biologist David Sisko. So don't miss that one. Uh, check it out in the link. We have our calendar of high SAM events and presentations in the Deal in Our link in there, as well as um, our upcoming high SAM awards, which are going to be presented later this month. Um, you can also follow the Hawaii Invasive Species Council Facebook. They have statewide um, opportunities, initiatives, um, really great resource for just anything conservation that's happening throughout the state. So go give them a follow if you have the chance and if you're on Facebook. Um, but with that, again, just want to mahalo everybody for participating. Um, it is 12 o'clock. If we have one or two minutes, if there's any burning questions people want to put in the chat, um, we can put that in and answer, um, but otherwise, I think that's it. So mahalo for a great first presentation to kick off, kick off high Sam starting in our Bao Akua. Mahalo nui, everybody.